Amen. God's good. Amen. Amen. We excited to get into God's word today. Amen. I'm excited to be here. We're going to dive right into scripture and I'm just going to, um, I'm going to be honest, after a worship moment like that, there's a few extra thoughts going through my head, but we're just going to try to to zero in on what the Lord is leading us today. And so I hope that you've just come excited. I hope you've come ready to hear from Jesus uh, this morning. We're just looking forward to a great time together. Um, again, my name is Josh. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I'm one of the associate pastors here at Bethel Church and just thankful to be here with all of you this morning. Actually, the associate pastor. I, I see a few faces grinning at me. I forgot. Sometimes I forget. But um, just thankful to be here with all of you this morning, thankful for this opportunity we have to dive into scripture together. Um, if you're newer to our church, maybe today's your first day or you maybe just missed the last couple weeks, we are kind of in the middle right now of our fall series um, that we've been walking through called Stable and Secure. And um, really the origin of this series, I remember a few months ago, Pastor Kurt and I, we were just talking a little bit about where the Lord might be leading our church here in this next. And he really came and just said, I feel like more than ever, we need to talk about what it would look like to live a stable life, to have a life of stability. And the reality is probably for all of history, there have been things that have led to instability for all of time. And right now we're just living in our time and in our moment but there's just something feels very different about what we're walking through today. When you, you know, Pastor Kurt, he's been giving different statistics about mental health. We all have seen over the last few years what, uh, how finances have no longer been a source of stability for many people, but have more been a source of fear and stress and anxiety. We see what's happening around the world. We see what's happening even within the church as church culture is deteriorating and as people are walking away from Christ. And it just feels, although maybe we're just living in the moment, I don't know, but it just feels like more than ever people are living lives of instability. People are, are not knowing what they can hold on to, what is real, what is false. They're looking for something. They're looking for their money. They're looking for their relationships. They're looking for their health. And every step of the way, it just feels like maybe on purpose, God is reminding us those things can't hold you. Those things can't keep you stable. That in the end of the day, our stability has and never will come from things we can possess. It won't even come from the people that we know. I always like uh, when we do um, marriage counseling. I've never done marriage counseling. I'm a little too young for that right now. But whenever we do marriage counseling, the very first thing that I know our counselors say, the very first thing it says, if you are looking for your spouse to fulfill you, you're going to have a struggle in your marriage. That your stability does not come from your spouse. And that applies to every relationship. Right now we have a class going on called Financial Peace. And day one of that is your money does not protect you. Your money does not sustain you. It is Jesus that, that sustains you. And that's been our core, uh, this entire series, our core scripture from Isaiah 33 is that God will be the stability of our times. That it has and always will be Jesus that stabilizes us. A relationship with Christ that keeps, us, um, that keeps us safe and keeps us secure. And throughout this series, what we've really been trying to focus in on is that as we're pursuing stability, the goal of pursuit of stability is not that everything works out in our favor. Not that everything works out the way we want it to. The goal of stability is that as I follow Jesus, he will be my stability, that he will protect me. It doesn't mean that everything works out the way I hope it does. What it means is that when the dust settles, I'll be okay. It means that when the end, I'll survive. I'll make it through because God is with me. See, this is the problem for so many people is they come to God with their ideas of what life is supposed to be like, of what stability is supposed to be like. My marriage should look like this. My finances should be like this. No one in my family should have to go through health battles. And they have their idea of what stability is supposed to be like. And they say, now, Lord, come and fulfill my version of this. And Jesus comes along and he says to his disciples in John 18, be assured of this, in this life you will experience many trials and tribulations. But take heart, for I've already overcome the world. The promise of stability is not that everything works out always the way we desired. It's not that everything works out the way where no one gets hurt. It just means that in the end of the day, God will sustain me, that God will protect me, that God will be enough even in the midst of my storm. And our motto, if you haven't written it down, or even if you have, write it down again. Our motto throughout this entire series is that we are stable 
because God is faithful. We're not stable because everything goes my way. We're stable because God is faithful. And that's the problem is so many of us, the reason we constantly find our lives in a state of flux and instability and we're struggling in different areas is because we kind of want God to come in and stabilize the things that are important to me and stabilize them the way that I want them to be. But I would imagine that every single person has found life has never fully worked the way you thought it was going to. All right? Life very rarely goes the way we think it's going to be. There are hills, there are valleys, there are times when things are great, and there are times when things are a struggle. But the promise of stability is that in all of those seasons, God is enough. And that God is faithful. And he will strengthen us. And one of the uh, passages of scripture that we've been kind of alluding to throughout this series is found in Matthew chapter 7. If you want to go there, you can. We're going to be in there just for a second. But in Matthew chapter 7, uh, we are on the tail end of probably the most famous sermon that Jesus ever taught, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, if you're, if you're a little newer to faith or the scriptures, the Sermon on the Mount is basically four chapters of Jesus walking his disciples and his followers through what it means to follow him, the practical sides of faith. You could kind of look at it and say that the Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' message about stability. It was, hey, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about relationships. I'm going to talk to you about your finances. I'm going to talk to you about how you treat other people. I'm going to talk to you about basically every single thing in life. If you are, again, newer to faith and you're looking for maybe a snapshot of what life with Jesus is supposed to look like, go read Matthew 4 to 7. Go read those passages. You'll get a very good idea of what Jesus thought stability looked like you'll get a very good idea of what Jesus looked like or what Jesus thought stability looked like for the life of a believer. But this is how he ends it. He brings all of it to the end here in Matthew chapter 7. At the very end, he ends it this way. He says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell and great was its fall. And so Jesus, after all of these discussions and conversations and teachings about what stability could look like, he brings it all to the end and says, listen, I've given you all the tools that you need. I've given you everything you need, but now I need you to understand something. It is not just simply about having the tools. It is not simply just about having the supplies. You need to now build your life upon what I've said. You need to build your life on a relationship with me, and that is what will keep you stable. He says, and he uses this illustration of two builders who both had to build their home, one built on the solid rock, one built on the sand, and the same storm came for both houses. And that's so important when we read this scripture, is that the storm hit both houses. Look at your neighbor and say both. Both houses. Building upon the right foundation didn't prevent the storm from coming. The storm came for both homes. The storm hit the house that was built on the sand. The storm hit the house that was built on the rock. The difference is that one was prepared and one was not. One fell and one was strong. Now, I think it's probably safe to say that even the house that was built on the rock, it probably took some damage. I can't imagine that maybe a shutter didn't break, a window maybe didn't break, maybe some side, I don't know if they had siding back then, whatever they had at that time. But, but regardless, I think that it's safe to say that even through the storm, there was some damage done. But there's a great difference between a broken window and a destroyed house. And, you know, listen, that's, that's, I think, what this series is kind of moving us to the understanding of, is that when we walk with Jesus, when we're growing with Jesus, this does not prevent the storms of life from coming. It doesn't prevent every injury along the way. It doesn't mean that we're not going to lose something along the way. Because the pursuit of stability is not the guarantee that everything works out in our favor. The pursuit of stability is the promise of survival. It's the promise that when the dust settles, when the storm is over, we'll be okay. That God will be enough. That he will sustain us in that season. 
But what I love about this story, too, and I think it's important, and maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just obvious to everyone and it's not that big of a deal. I don't know. But what I love about this story is it's a reminder that both builders still had to build. They both had to still build their home. The, even the one that was built upon the rock, it's not like he came to God and said, all right, God, I'm putting my trust in you, now build my house. No, he came and said, I'm going to build my life on you, the Lord. But there was still work that he had to do. There was still work that God had, had, had designed for him. And that's something that we need to understand. A lot of us, our definition of stability is to come to the Lord, say a prayer, and say, now, Lord, fix everything. That's not what stability is. Now, I want to make it very clear from the beginning. Our salvation is not at all dependent on my works for the Lord. <laughs> not at all. There is nothing I can do to earn my salvation. Uh, nothing I could do to rescue myself. But as someone who has been rescued from my sin, as someone who has walked in the grace and the mercy of the Lord, there are things that God has called me to do. There are things that God has asked me to be obedient in. And the struggle for many of us is that we don't want to put the work of our salvation in. We don't want to do the things that God has asked us, be it we don't want to make church a regular part of our life. We want to be part of the 80% that show up once a month. We don't want, we, we know what the Bible says about healthy relationships, but I don't really want to do those things. I don't want to forgive people that hurt me. I don't want to let go of grudges. I don't want to stop gossiping. So I'm just going to say, Lord, strengthen my relationships, and then I wonder why they don't get strengthened. I know what the Bible says about good stewardship, but you know what? I really like that 10%. So I'm just going to ask, Lord, please bless me, but I really don't want to put the work of stability in. You know, there's a, we have a running joke in our family that when companies or advertising agencies, when they sit down, and uh, I'm not a marketer, so I'm sure I'm going to mess a little bit of this up, but there's kind of the idea that when you're trying to promote a product, when you're trying to market something, you have to kind of design the type of person that you're trying to target, because not everybody is going to buy that product. So you've got to really zero in. What, what age is this person? What do they value? What is important to them? All those types of things. And so our running joke is that when advertising agencies sit down and they design that person, in every circumstance, it's me. In every circumstance, I am the guy that they target because I will believe just about anything. All right? It doesn't matter. As long as the colors are cool on the commercial, it's got like a late 90s, early 2000s pop song like from my childhood, you've got me. All right? I'm, I'm in. It does not take much to convince me. If you tell me that eating liver is going to make me live longer, I'll go for it. I, I, didn't, I haven't actually done that because I tried it and I just I couldn't, I couldn't do it. But I can't tell you the amount of times I've come home and told my whole family, guys, we just, we, we, we're drinking too much water. You know what? Maybe we need to be in the sun longer. Maybe we're supposed to walk around barefoot because it's better for Like all these weird things that you hear. If they want to get me to believe anything, they just have to tell me you'll live a little bit longer. You'll, you'll, you'll look a little bit younger, whatever. If, as long as they tell me, I'm going to believe it. Because in the end, aren't we all like that in some ways? Because we would far rather just take a little tiny step than do all the work that it actually requires. In the end, like I'll just use health and exercise as an example. There's all these people out there that will tell you, you do this for two months, you'll look, exact, you'll look 100% different. But we all know instinctively that's not true. Because as long as humans have been alive, it is simply eat well, exercise, drink your water, and get, and get plenty of sleep. That's all you need. And you don't need to have all these fats, but I'm not that way. I'm just more like, yeah, give me the quick solution because that seems better. That seems more fun. And so, any, so if any of you have products that you want to test run, don't come to me because I'll just, I'll just take it. I'll just, I'm good with it. But that's the way we treat faith sometimes. A lot of times we don't want to put the work in, the effort in. And that's really what this series is about. This series is about, listen, if you want to be stronger mentally, have a greater mental health, then there are things that God has asked us to do to move in that direction. If you want to have stronger relationships, and that's what we're going to talk about next week, then there are some things that you can start to do that may not guarantee that everything works perfectly, but it'll help you be stable in all of those things. You know, that's been our whole thing is even within our relationships, you can do all the right things and it still may not work out perfectly, but you'll be okay. And that's what this whole series is about is giving us the steps, the tools that Jesus laid forward to say here, if you can start to build on these things, you're going to be okay. You're going to be stable. But here's my question that I want to pose this morning to everybody. What happens 
when you've put in the work? What happens when you've taken the right steps, you've gone to scripture, you've found the right people around you to keep you accountable? What happens when you've done all the things that you're supposed to do and everything still falls apart? What do you do when you've done everything you're supposed to do to build this life of stability and it still feels like everything comes caving in on you, comes to tearing down on you. And listen, so, and a lot of you can already relate to this because you've been there before. You've been in church all your life. You've studied the scriptures. You've been surrounded in Christian community. And so you know that, as, that there are times in life where no matter how many verses you've memorized, no matter how many sermons you've come through, there are just seasons of life that are so out of left field, so unexpected, so painful, so life up, lit, uh, lit, you know, up, I don't think that's the right word, you know, whatever it is. The, the, you know what I mean, though. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, you know what I mean. All right. There are seasons of life that are so challenging that for a moment, and I, I hope you understand what I say, because scripture always matters. But there are some times where no matter how many verses you seem to have memorized, they don't seem to be enough today. Where no matter how many strong relationships you've built, they don't seem to be enough. Where no matter how many church services you've attended, no matter how many outreaches you've been part of, no matter what steps you've taken, they just seem somehow insufficient to rebuild what has been broken. And so the question is, what do we do? What do we rest in there? And I want to take you real quick. We're going to read three verses in Exodus chapter 2. In Exodus chapter 2, we, we meet again the people of Israel. In, that, in, the, in, the, the, uh, in the book of Genesis, we learn the origins of the people of Israel. How God brought them out of one man, Abraham. How he blessed and multiplied this family through the generations. And how God had promised that through this nation, all of the nations of the world will be blessed. And what we know is that it was going to be through the nation of Israel that the Messiah would come, that Jesus would come into this world, that salvation would be made possible. But God promised them, a lot like what we're talking about, that it wouldn't just be smooth sailing along the way, that there were going to be dark moments for this family. There were going to be seasons of suffering. And in Exodus chapter 1, we learn how the people of Israel made their way to Egypt. And everything was, was great, everything was on good terms, everything was under the best of circumstances. But God blessed that family so much that they began to outgrow the nation of Egypt. And so the leaders of Egypt felt, you know what, if they get big enough, they're going to overthrow us. They're going to take over what, what we have. So the best thing to do is to kill their children and enslave them. And so in Exodus chapter 2, that's what we see. We see the people of Israel, their, their newborns are being slaughtered. The, the adults are being thrown into slavery, and that is Egypt's way of putting a hold on the nation of Israel. And what we find at the very end of chapter 2, the very end of chapter 2, if you want to go there, verse 23, the very end of chapter 2, it says this as they began to pray. And if we want to put that verse on the screen, we can. In the end of Exodus chapter 2, it says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. And their cry of rescue reached the Lord, and God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Look at your neighbor and say, God sees, and God knows. God sees, and God knows. If you don't remember anything else that I'm going to say for the rest of our half hour together, you know it's probably not going to be that long. If you forget everything else, just know this, that there is a power that comes from simply knowing that God sees you and that God knows. There, there is a power that comes from just knowing that God is walking with you, that no steps can match. That you can put all the work and all the steps in, but in the end of the day, there are going to be seasons where what's going to carry you is not the steps you've taken or all the things you've done to try to build. It is going to be that foundation that can only come through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And just simply knowing that he sees your circumstance, that he's with you, and he knows, is going to be more than enough to carry you. About a year ago... About a year ago, a little over a year ago, 
uh, Linda and I and the other pastors uh, at the church, we went to uh, Hershey, PA for an annual pastors conference. We go there once a year uh, just as an opportunity to gather with the pastors around New Jersey. We fellowship together. We encourage one another. Always a great, great time. And it's in Hershey, so it's a lot of chocolate. So it's a great, great, great week. Um, and uh, last year we went there as normal, and I was really excited to go because uh, I won't say the name, but the speaker that they had brought in for us for the weekend was someone that really, um, really meant a lot to me because I had heard him first, I guess it would have been about 16 years prior when I was a, youth, a high school student here at our church. Um, every year in November, there's our annual New Jersey Youth Convention, which is actually this Friday. So pray for our students and parents. If you haven't registered your kids, here's your plug. Um, we'll just throw it in. But Every year we take our students to New Jersey Youth Convention, and um, I remember when I was a student, we came and we heard this speaker, and man, it was powerful. Well, I just remember as like a 16-year-old how powerful his messages were, and it, what's funny is like, and I, I, I hate to admit it, I don't really remember many sermons that I heard when I was young. <laughs> I don't really, most of us probably don't. Very rarely are we going to remember a lot of messages we heard. What we will remember is moments in the presence of Jesus. That's what we will remember, is moments in his presence. And I remember it was the last night of youth convention. He spoke, and it was, it probably wasn't the first time I had ever experienced this, but it was the first one that I think really resonated with me. He, uh, he just began to open the altars for people to come, be healed, be restored, and I remember, because we, we were there, at this, the event was supposed to end at 9. I don't think we left until midnight. And we saw that night physical healings. Pe students that showed up in wheelchairs left on their feet. We saw ch uh, students delivered from homosexuality that night. I remember, it was so vivid. It was powerful, powerful night. I've never forgot that speaker ever since then. And then probably, I guess it would have been about like four years later, he came to speak at the church that I was attending when I was uh, in school in Texas. I was down in Dallas for a few years, and he came and spoke. And I remember, and it was, again, it was a powerful service, very similar to that one. And so I was really excited when I heard that he was going to be the speaker for this event. I was like, oh, I love this guy. He, he's great. And I told Linda all about him. I was telling the staff. They hadn't really heard of him before. I said, you guys are going to be blown away. And he was fantastic. He, he really brought forth the word of the Lord. It was challenging. It was powerful. And, um, but I remember it was the last night, the last night that we were together on this, uh, for this event. He did his whole message. We prayed. It was a great service, like normal. But then at the end, he paused. And I guess I should give a little bit of preference. Um, a lot of this speaker's ministry is geared toward the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit. And just believing for miracles. Believing that God is able. Um... And all of us can do that. You don't have to have a specific gift to believe for miracles. We all can believe for miracles. Uh, Jesus says, if your faith is the size of a mustard seed, mountains can move. All right? And I just challenge you with that because it's possible that at the end, when we take communion, we're going to believe for some miracles today. All right? But at the end of service, he, he finished up his message, and then he, he just paused. And everyone was kind of like, all right, what's going on? What's going on? And he said, listen, guys, I, I don't want to sound strange but I want to be obedient to the Lord. He said, there is a gentleman in this room who has a back injury that he's had now for about a decade. I remember this so vividly. And he said, you've tried to maintain it. You've tried to just avoid it. But now it's getting to the point where it's hindering your ministry. It's taking you away from your family. And I believe that God wants us to step out in faith and pray for you today. And he just said, I would just wonder if you that person would have the boldness to stand up. And you know, all, you know, all of our eyes are supposed to be closed, but all of us have like one eye open and we're like, who is it, who is it, who is it? And wouldn't you know, it took a couple seconds, but a pastor stood up, someone that we all know, a pastor that was very well known around the state. And he stood right up. And not only did he stand up, he lifted up just the, the end of his shirt and he unhitched a back brace that he had been wearing for a decade. And pastor didn't even have to say anything. We just ran and started praying for him, believing for miracles. We're in the middle of praying, and all of a sudden the pastor says, another person, he says, another pastor, your spouse just got diagnosed with terminal cancer. 
this week. And he said, I think we got to pray. Wouldn't you know it? Hand went right up. We started praying for him. And I kid you not, for about the next hour or so, 20 different individuals, this just God revealed in that moment what they were struggling with. For the others, it was healing. I remember there was one individual, his church had really struggled to get back on its feet since the pandemic. And they were on the verge of closing the doors. And we prayed that God would bring a miracle, that God would save that church so that that city would have a Bible-believing, spirit-filled church in its community. And uh, for about an hour, we just prayed. And I just remember, I, I don't know if every one of those prayer requests were answered that night. I didn't go follow up with everyone. I do believe some of them were. But that really wasn't the point that night. The point that, well, at least for me, what I walked away with is God sees us. God knows. He's with us. Like, I can only imagine those individuals, when they walked into that service, the weight that was on all of them. I can imagine how discouraged they might have been, how much of a struggle it might have been for them. And just, just that moment to know that God saw them, that God knew, and that we had that moment to pray, we just left with so much faith. All the staff, we left just believing, like, we're going to bring this faith back to Bethel. We're going to do, we're going to believe God for miracles, and we're going to believe great things to come forward. It was just such a powerful night. And Linda and I, it was late when the service got done, so we were hungry. So we just went in town and found somewhere to eat. And I just remember just looking at each other, and, and in a good way. This wasn't, don't take this the wrong way. We just said, what a powerful service. And we just, we said to ourselves, and again, don't take this the wrong way, because you wouldn't want to be in this position, I guess. But we said, what would it be like to be on the receiving end of a moment like that? And just, what would, what would that be like? Again, you, you never want to necessarily be in the position where you need that. But there's still something that's just like, what would it be like for God to speak so vividly into my life? And, and again, we, didn't, we weren't angry or anything like that. It was just, we were filled with faith. We were excited. We were just ready for what God was going to do. Little did we know that about 18 hours after that, we were going to have that moment with the Lord in a way that we never could have imagined or prepared for. The next day, I remember it was a Wednesday, I'm going to shout out our amazing Bethel youth team. Uh, we got an amazing team at Bethel youth, and they, they, they said, Pastor Josh, why don't you and Linda just take the night off? You guys are already out. We've got service. So they took the night for us, which I was so thankful for. We got the best, best, youth, best youth team in the world here. And so Linda and I decided, you know what, let's just kind of make a day of it. There was this restaurant out in Lancaster that we wanted to go to, so we went and tried that out. And then uh, we bought tickets. A lot of you have been there before. There's this massive Christian-owned uh, theater out in Lancaster called Sight and Sound. A lot of you guys have heard of Sight and Sound. It's, I mean, I've been to Broadway, so I think I can say this. It is Broadway level, if not better. It is, it is that good. And it is all biblically based uh, shows and stories that tell the message of the gospel. And last year, some of you saw it, they announced a play that was like years in the making. Everybody was waiting for it, and it was David. We were all ready to see David. A lot of you saw David. Music was incredible. Like, it was, we were all waiting for it. So Linda and I said, why don't we go buy tickets to that? So we grabbed the tickets, and uh, we went to lunch, went to the theater. And, you know, we got there early. We went and got the souvenirs. Like, we did everything. We, were really, we really enjoyed it. And uh, we found our seats front row. Linda did good. She got front row tickets. We were right in the front of the stage. It was awesome. And um, lights start dimming, someone comes out, they welcome everybody, they pray over the show, and um, then, in, you know, they pray over the show, and then the curtains go up, and the show's going to begin, I kid you not, 100%. The moment the curtains lifted, my phone started blowing up. I was like, what is going on? I pulled out my phone, and it was my dad, Pastor Kurt, in case you don't know. Um, it was Pastor Kurt. And my initial reaction was just, well, I just saw Pastor Kurt like three hours ago at this conference. He probably just forgot that we had tickets to the show. I'll call him back at intermission. So I texted him and I just said, hey, Dad, I'm in, I'm in the show. I can't, I can't take this call right now. He says, uh, can, I say, can I call you back later? And he said, I really need you to take this phone call. And I said, I should have known then, but I said, Dad, I'm in the front row. The show just began. There's 5,000 people in here. There's animals coming down the aisles. Like, I can't. I said, I can't leave. I said, I can't leave. And uh, I will never forget this. 
uh, I actually went back into my text messages to verify that this is exactly what he said. He said, Josh, whatever you have to do, and this is unlike my dad to say this, whoever you have to go through, you have to take this phone call. That's not like my dad <laughs> to say something like that. We're a very non-combative family. <laughs> um, so I said, okay, all right. So I just, I, Linda didn't even know I was texting at that point. So I just said, Lynn, um, I gotta take a call, something church related. I just assumed it was church related. And uh, so I fought off all the animals in the, in the aisle. Like I got horses coming at me. It was a little, little sketchy there. But I got, I got to the hallway and a few of the ushers, they grabbed me and they said, hey, is everything okay? The show has just started. I said, everything's fine. I just, a uh, work call that I gotta take. And they said, okay. So I got out in the lobby, I found a quiet spot and I called my dad back. I said, dad, what's up? What's happening? And uh, some of you have seen, experienced this. And I should say this too. Everything I'm gonna share, I've, I've gotten permission from the people I needed to get permission from to share. Um, but some of you have been there where literally a 90 second phone call changes your life forever. Like 90 seconds. Our lives are 70, 80, 90 years, and yet everything can change in seconds. I said, Dad, what's up? And he said, Josh, I don't know how to tell you this. And I know that you're away, and I know that you guys had this whole day planned. I, I know that it's, but you need to know that your father in law, which would be Linda's. Linda's husband, his name was Joe. A lot of you knew Joe. Or, I'm sorry. <laughs> Father, <laughs> Father, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, he just said, he says he's gone. And um, he said he's gone very, very suddenly and very tragically. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, and I, I, I've told my dad this, so I don't think he'll be offended. I totally tuned out the conversation. Like I just, I, I don't think I blacked out, but I just didn't hear anything he said after that. And the only, I mean, there's a lot of thoughts that you start thinking of very quickly when you hear this, but the, the only thing I can really remember thinking of is how am I supposed to tell this to Linda? And not just like, like how, like what are the words, but it's just like, how, how do I look my wife in the eye and tell her, She's never going to see her father again. I'm totally at a loss. And somewhere along the way, I came back to the conversation. And I remember my dad asking, he's like, do you want me to come get you guys? And I said, we're, we're already two hours away. I can't wait another four hours for you to get here. We got to get home and we got to be with family. And so we, he prayed. We prayed over the phone and uh, hung up. And I just, I needed a second stepped outside, um, found this little bench, and I just sat down there for what felt like an hour. I think it was really only seconds. But as I sat there, literally millions of thoughts started flooding. Like it just, it all started coming in. I said, how am I going to talk to my wife? What happened? Uh, wh where's my mother-in-law? Where's my brother? Where's my sister? Like what are, what's happening with them? What are we going to do? Like just, I mean, it literally, it felt like I was having an out-of-body experience in that moment. And 100% true, what I'm going to tell you. Remember the service that was the night before. Remember that. Hand touches my shoulder. I think I was a little spooked. I kind of jumped. <laughs> and because uh, I don't think I was all there at the moment. And it was one of the sight and sound workers. And uh, he said, sir, uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the, uh, the parking attendants here. I was like, oh, Jeremy, nice to meet you. Just trying to make, I didn't know what he wanted. I was just trying to make some small talk. I said, how are you? And he says, I'm fine. And he says, sir, he's like, I don't want to assume anything because you're here at Sight and Sound. I don't want to assume you're a believer in Jesus. But he said, I am. And he said, I know this might seem weird, might seem strange. Same words as the speaker before. He said, I just want to be obedient to the Lord. I said, okay. I said, awesome. He said, the moment that you left the theater, I started sensing something in my heart about you and your family. I said, okay. And he just said, what God needs you to know right now is that he sees you and he's with your family. He says, God is showing me that something is about to happen in your family that you weren't ready for. 
that you could have never prepared for, but that he is going to be with you. And he's going to protect you through this. So, amen. Maloney. And then, um, and then he shared a few things that were really just for me. And those aren't things I'd necessarily share with anybody. Just some things that he needed me, to, I guess, to know. And I said, Jeremy, I, I just said, I told him everything. And I said, you will never know <laughs> what this meant in this. And I just told him, I said, I, I'm sitting here like just trying to figure out what am I supposed to do? And we just sat there and I prayed with Jeremy and we just had this beautiful moment. And, and then Jeremy said, I'm going to step to the side and I'm going to be here if you need me. I said, thank you. And I just said, Lord, help us. Took a deep breath. <laughs> I just texted Linda and I said, I say, I think you need to come out we got to go home. And uh, I'm not going to share any more about that part of the story because those are still things that I'm working through that day. But we, we got in the car and we headed home and we sat with our family and we began a season that we never, ever would have thought that we were going to go through. And um, ho hopefully this doesn't negate the story. I think a lot of people will understand this. And I had this wonderful moment with this sight and sound worker. But then all of a sudden it all begins. It all starts. And, you know, sometimes we have a way of kind of forgetting the things that God did. <laughs> sometimes the things that are right in front of us just sometimes cloud out those moments. So it was probably like two or three days later, um, I took the dog to the dog park because he was getting antsy. <laughs> there had been more people than he had ever experienced in his life just coming and going. He needed to get out. I think I needed a minute out, so we have a dog park here that we go to where I can just let him off the leash, let him run, and so I just took him there, and I just started praying. This cold morning, a lot of people there, so they probably thought I was crazy, I don't know, but I just started praying, and all I remember praying was, Lord, I don't know what to do. I said, I have been in the church all my life. I said, there has not been a single day of my life where I was away from the church. I have studied the Bible. I'm in that moment, I, this is what I felt. I'm supposed to be a pastor. I'm supposed to know what to do. And I feel no adequacy at all for what we're facing. I don't know how to be a good husband right now. I don't know how to be a good son in law. I don't know how to be a good brother in law. I don't know how to lead in this moment. Like, I don't know. And, and it wasn't even just about me. I said, and then my heart is for all of my family. And I'm like, I just. What do we do? What do we do? And the Lord, subtly as only he can, just reminded me about Jeremy. And he took me right back to that sight and sound courtyard where he and I prayed together. Where he showed me tangibly that he sees and that he knows and that he's with us. A couple days after that, hope this doesn't make me sound cheap. Um, a couple days after that, I called Sight and Sound up. And I just said, hey, my wife and I were there last week, and we had to leave because of a family emergency. I said, is it possible that I could get a refund for those? Those were expensive tickets. Not the most important thing, but I just figured I'd ask. They were expensive. I said, or could I get them rescheduled for another day? Something like that. And again, these are just only God, only God. The woman that I talked to said, Mr. Kinney, she already knew my name. I didn't tell her what my name was. She said, Mr. Kinney. I said, okay. She said, um, she says, that's already been taken care of. They said, we've already got the tickets rescheduled for you guys. That's not a problem. She says, but what we need you to know is that the moment you left the theater, the moment I walked out, hadn't even got on the phone yet, they said, our entire team at Sight and Sound knew something was up. And while you were outside, 30 of us were praying for you and your family. Only God. And I'll tell you what, just as an encouragement but a challenge, can you imagine? This is at a theater. Can you imagine if our church operated that way? Where every person that walked in here, we were so in tune with the Holy Spirit. We were so close to Jesus that we knew people's hurts and pains the moment that they walked in. And we could pray over them. And we could believe for miracles. Amen.
possible. That's, that's what the church is. But she said, we were praying for you. And then Jeremy came in and he told us what happened. And we haven't stopped praying for you in the last week. And here's this, this really cool part. And I'm going to bring the story to an end and we're going to take communion together. So about two months later, Linda and I went back to see the show. It was, it was strange going back there for sure. Some things we kind of had to walk through and work through first. But we went back. The show was amazing. If David ever comes back to town, go see it. Go see it. Um, but during intermission, we, we walked out just to use the restroom, get something to eat. And one of the ushers came and found us. They knew who we were. They, they knew exactly who we were. And they said, hey, how are you guys? We said, we're, we're good. We're good. We're, we're thankful to be here. And they said, we have someone that we want you to, to meet. I said, okay. And I think we have a picture of it. We, uh, they brought us to Jeremy. Jeremy was there that night. And they brought us over to Jeremy. And, um, and we sat with him for about 15 minutes. Um, totally forgot to go to the bathroom and all the stuff we went out to do. We just talked with Jeremy for about 15 minutes. And we got to know his story. Turns out he's a missionary that was here on leave and just working at Sight and Sound in the meantime. And um, we got a chance to hear his story. We prayed with him. He and I exchanged numbers, and we still text to today. And um, in fact, actually, back in September, when we hit the one year since we lost, um, since we lost Joe, he texted me that morning. He knew, and he just checked in on our family to see how we were doing. And I, I, um, I will never, the rest of my life, forget my moment with Jeremy. And although I was the only one that experienced that moment, it has been a moment that has encouraged our family. And what I can just say is this, and I want you to know, I'm not sharing this story to try to get sympathy. God's been good to us. I'm not sharing this story to try to be overly dramatic. That's not what I'm doing. But there are just these moments where I believe that we need to know that God sees and that God knows and that he's walking with us even in the darkest moments. And I know, and I know that our story is not unique because it's a story that so many of you have experienced too. Where in the darkest moments, God gave you a moment to just remind you that I'm with you. That I'm walking through this with you because your stability isn't going to come in that everything goes the way you thought it would. But your stability comes through me. In that moment, it felt like the entire house we built came crashing down. But in that one moment with Jeremy, I knew, but the foundation was still there. Because Jesus was there. And because he was with us. And he was walking through it with us. And I can say this on behalf of our entire family. For the last 14 months, we have seen nothing but the faithfulness of God. That does not mean that it hasn't hurt. And it does mean that some windows haven't been broken and there's some pain that has to be healed. But what I can say is that we're here standing. Today, all four members of my family that are part of that were serving in church this morning. Three on the worship team, my brother in the back of the room helping make it all look good on the screen. God has been with us. And he's going to be with you. There are some of you here that you haven't slept in months because of the battles of your mind. And Jesus needs you to know that he's with you and that he sees you. There are some of you, your spouse has already told you that they're ready to leave. And Jesus needs you to know I'm with you. I see you and I know. There are some of you that you or someone close to you, you have, ex you have heard health news that has thrown your world upside down. And Jesus needs you to know, I'm with you. I see you. There are some of you that right now, you are wondering where is the money going to come from? And he's with you. Miss Gwendolyn, how long have we been praying for your eye to be healed? A year? Just about. God sees you. And he hears you. And he knows that he's with you. Amen. I was just, um, on Wednesday, there was an individual from our church 
that needed to go to the emergency room but couldn't get there themselves. So I helped get them there. And I spent the whole day in the Cooper Hospital emergency room. All day long I was there. And I'm just going to put it this way. It was a strange day in the ER that day. It was, it was not an easy day in the emergency room that day. But I remember I was sitting there. Uh, the person I was with had finally kind of gotten some rest. So I was just sitting there on my phone just being with them. And I looked out the hallway of the emergency room. And one of our young adults um, that, is, that is right now training and studying to be in the medical field, she was, she was there making her rounds. And uh, I didn't want to bother her because she was busy. I could tell. It was, a, like I said, a wild day in the emergency room. But I just, to myself, I just prayed for her because I knew, wow, this is a stressful place to be. <laughs> but when I left, I tried to find her real quick. And I just, I found her and I just, you know, we just made some small talk real quick. And I just took a moment to encourage her. I said, you know, I said, this is a tough life that you're living. But I just want you to know you're making a difference. And you have an opportunity to be a light in the darkest of places here. And she looked at me and said, Pastor Josh, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been really feeling overwhelmed with where I'm at. She says, it's been stressful. She says, I walk into this room every day to so much darkness and so much pain that it's overwhelming. She says, and I'm surrounded daily by thousands of people, and yet I've never felt more alone. And she says, when I was driving to the hospital today, I just prayed to the Lord, Lord, could you just help me see a familiar face today? Come on. And then in, in, in I show. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with a God that sees and a God that knows. And that's what he needs you to know today. The book of Psalms, I'm not going to read the whole verse, but it tells us that our Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And that he rescues those who cry out to him. And if you walk away with nothing else from today's message, what I hope you know is that today and for the rest of your life, God sees you and God knows. And that's a knowledge that only can come when we know him, when we're walking with him. But there is a power in just simply knowing he's with us that will carry you day in and day out. And what I would love for us to do in the spirit of that, could we stand and just share communion together? I honestly feel like there could be no more fitting time to take communion than this. Because if there is anything, well, there's a lot of things that we learn from the cross of Jesus. But one thing that I see in the cross of Christ is a God that sees and a God that knows. The Bible tells us that while we were yet sinners, while we were enemies of God, Christ came to die for us, to rescue us, because God sees and God knows. Even when we weren't looking for him, God saw you. God poured out his love upon you at the cross of Christ. And so today as we take communion together, may we celebrate the God who sees and the God that knows. And the team, they're going to lead us in a simple chorus as we just prepare our hearts. And as always, we're going to take this as a moment to do two things today. To first, I'm going to ask you to take this moment to examine your heart before the Lord. The Bible tells us that if we come to the Lord in communion in an unholy manner, that we drink and eat judgment upon ourselves. But if we're willing to confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us. And so as they sing, use this as a moment to examine your heart. But also let it be a moment to get close to the God who sees, the God who heals. And let him heal as only he can. So could you guys lead us in that song just for a moment? You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. 
Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, our all in all, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we worship you today. We thank you that you are the God that sees, the God that knows, and that while we were yet sinners, while we weren't looking for you, you looked for us. And we can never try to repay you for what you've done. But today we surrender our hearts and our lives to you. Lord, if there is any unrepented sin in, in our lives, we repent of it now. And ask that you would forgive us. That you would cleanse us. We thank you for your body that was broken for us. The bread of life. May we never take your sacrifice for granted, but honor it each day in how we live. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's take together. That taste is never going to get, we're never going to get used to that taste, I don't think. Every, every time I think it's going to taste better, but it's not there. In the same way, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Jesus, we thank you for your blood, your blood that still has the power to save, still has the power to cleanse. Jesus, help us to live every day in light of your cross. Lord, may we never allow the cross of Christ or the blood that you shed to become a common thing. 
may it never just become a, a piece of what we do. May we remember that our lives were purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ and that apart from it, we have nothing in this world. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take together. Amen. You can hold on to those at the, at the end of service. Ushers will be available to collect all of your, um, all the communion supplies. But as we just close in prayer today, would you just lift your hands one final time to our God who sees and knows. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, we are so unworthy of anything that you've given us. And so today, we just praise you. And today, Lord, I pray that in every season, no matter what anyone is walking through, may they know today that you see them and that you know that they are not alone, but you're walking through this with them. But Jesus also in one voice, I don't need to know the requests. In faith, we believe for miracles this morning. In faith, we believe for healing. We believe for restoration. We believe for chains to be broken, for addictions to be shattered. We pray for families to be reunited. We pray for financial miracle where it is needed. We pray that depression and anxiety would have to flee in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we believe that we're going to hear testimonies of what you have done. Lord, go with us this week. May your hand of grace be upon this church, upon these people. May your anointing be upon us wherever we go. And help us to take this same hope that we have to the world around us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Have a wonderful, wonderful week in Jesus.